Okay, um, looking at the 2014 question here, um, it's the dihedralangle question. Has it come up in the last year or two, so it'll probably be due to come up again this year. Um, quite straightforward, to give you the coordinates, so I've drawn that up already, um, see in a second. No measurements missing, so you know, no problems there. Looking at what the makeup of the question is then, um, it's based on the head of a perfume bottle, um, a, a partial section of it. First thing they ask you is to draw the elevation and plan view using those coordinates, so that's pretty straightforward. The next part of the question then is asking you to determine the dihedral angle between the planes. So, on the drawing so far, I've just set out the coordinates. This is what the elevation and plan view looks like. To find the dihedral angle between the two planes, I have to identify my line of intersection. And in this case, it's the line going from A to B. So, I'm just going to highlight that on the page so you can see it in both elevation and in plan view. So that line that I've just highlighted is the line of intersection. It's the line that both planes have in common with each other. So the dihedral angle has to be on that point of that line. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the usual steps to get our dihedral angle when we have our line of intersection. The first stage is we're going to look perpendicular to that view. <coughs> um, I prefer to do it from the plan view. You can do it from either view, but I prefer to start from the plan view just out of habit. So I'm going to go to my line of intersection in plan view, and I'm going to look perpendicular to it in an auxiliary. So that's going to involve setting up an x1, y1 line to begin with. Try and keep the x1, y1 line, or try and keep any auxiliaries as close as possible, because if you tend to leave large distances, it can make the drawing awkward later on. So, I'm going to use that as my x1, y1. It's parallel to that line there, so there, two of them are parallel. Everything, the points I'm going to bring out are going to come perpendicular to that. So I'm going to bring A and B out first of all, and I'm going to be able to use my adjustable. <coughs> so I'll use sliding sets first. That's the common line brought out. And I'm going to bring out points belonging to either surface. You can bring out all the points if you want, but it's really unnecessary. You only have to bring a minimum of three. So you triangulate the surfaces really, bring the minimum amount of possible points to keep the accuracy of the question as best as you can. So in this case, with the first surface, A, B, C, D, I'll just triangulate that to be A, B, C. I'll put a little broken line just to indicate that. So I'm just dealing with that section of the surface. Likewise, I'll do the same with the other surface. I'm going to triangulate it to be A, B, and G would probably be the handiest point. You can choose any of them, but the one closest to it is probably easiest. So likewise, those two lines are going to come out at the same angle, perpendicular to my line of intersection. So I bring G out, and I'll also bring C. Now in the first auxiliary, the heights come from the elevation because you're going back two views all the time for heights. So I'll mark off the height of A and B first of all. That's A. Label them as you're doing them because it can be quite easy to lose track. Do the same with B. If you've color coded your line of intersection, Try and maintain that colour coding throughout all of your views. It makes the examiner much easier to follow what you're actually doing. And they tend to give you the marks a lot quicker if they haven't got to go looking for how you did something. And finally, G. So, I join up my surfaces. My line of intersection is A to B. That goes to C to complete that surface, so that's triangulated. And it also goes to G to complete the second surface, triangulated. And maintain colour coding, so AB is my line of intersection. First step, true length, line of intersection, complete. Second step, to complete the dihedral angle part of this question, is to uh, look through your true length. So we're going to create a second auxiliary, 
this time looking through the line of intersection. So I'll in this direction. Create the x2, y2. Again, try and keep it as close as possible. Still keep it neat, but don't have it too far away from the previous auxiliary. Label up everything you're doing. So we have x2, y2. And we're going to bring <coughs> our four points up in the same direction. So G and C have to come up like so. If you can use an adjustable for this, it's probably more accurate. It just doesn't suit just the way I've set it up. Now, any measurements for an auxiliary, you go back two views to get them. So if I'm in the second auxiliary here, if I go back to the first one, and I go back to the plan view. So that means measurements are coming from the X and Y1 line back to the plan view, and I can mark them up here in my second auxiliary. The reason I told you to try and keep your X1, Y1, X2, Y2 lines as close as possible is because when you're going back views for measurements, you don't want to be going filling up your measurements with empty space. So if you keep the, them as close as possible, it just keeps the measurements a lot neater to work with. So for instance, I have quite a small distance to go back to get point C, and I can mark that off label it as I'm doing it, it only takes a second. A and B should be the same measurement as you can see, so that means if they're looking along the same line and they're the same distance back, they appear as a single point, so that's kind of like the hinge point of your dihedral angle. And finally G will complete the second auxiliary. So when I join my surfaces together, I have ABC, an edge view of one of the surfaces, and I have ABG, another edge view of one of the surfaces, and the angle between them is the dihedral angle. So pretty routine. Always make sure and label it, either by writing dihedral angle, or you'll often see people putting in symbol or a lot of people go and actually measure it and put in the degrees of the angle whichever you, you have time for now um, that's the first part of the question the routine part finished next up with this particular one we see that they are asking us to determine the true shape of surface a b c d going back to my elevation my plan view a b c d is this particular shape here with the four points been joined together. Um, you can see it's angled away from you. So if you were to imagine it almost being like a set square, I know it only has three points, but imagine just a surface pointing away from you. So you can't see the true shape of it. In order to see the true shape of something, you have to be looking straight at it. So to see the true shape of this set square, I would drop it down on the page. Or I would stand it upright, vertical, so that I'm looking straight at it. I can do either of those with this surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish what angle it's pitched away from me at and then I'm going to rotate it or hinge it so that it's flat in front of me. So the best way of doing that, a number of ways you can do it, but the best way of doing it would be to pick a line that you're going to hinge it on. Probably the most easiest line to hinge it on would be the line CB because the line CB in plan view is level so it's easy to use it as a hinge and it's also the closest in terms of my XY line so it's the closest to my vertical uh, trace or sorry my vertical plane um, so that in, in elevation that means if I was to look in from the side almost like an end view create like a temporary wall and look in I would see CB as my hinge line. So this is looking in from the, the right hand side. And I would see AD a set distance away from it, which I'll take from plan view. And what that'll do is it shows me the angle that it's pitched at. So if I just take that angle and using CB as the hinge point, reverse it back down so that it's vertically flat in front of me, I bring that back to my elevation. The widths of the actual surface aren't going to change, 
So I just drop down AB to the new location. And that means that I'm able to fill in what the true shape of that surface looks like. So it's much longer than it appeared initially. But the width's maintained the same. Well, now, whatever way you want to highlight that part of the answer, you, I've done it in broken lines. You could, if you had time, um, perhaps color code it, hatch it in in a particular color, label it, completely up to yourself. But just make sure it's very obvious to the examiner that that's what you've done. So that's the true shape of A, B, C, D. Okay, so that was actually relatively quick to answer. Now, the next part of this question, which is the last part, um, is centered around another imaginary part on this surface, which is called surface S. If you look at the illustration that's given in the question, surface S is indicated here. And you can see it's based on the line that we have already, which is EF. What they tell us about it is that the surface S is going to be a regular hexagon. So that means all the angles are the same and all the sides are the same length. EF is one of the sides of this hexagon. And what they want you to do on a separate diagram is, in full size, show what the true shape of that hexagon would look like. So show what the surface S would look like. If it's a regular hexagon, all the sides have the same length. So if I'm able to get the true length of that line EF, and it's a hexagon, so 360 degrees divided by 8 will give me a 45 degree internal angle. If I know the length of the sides, I can simply just draw out the hexagon relatively straightforward. So going back to my question, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to get a true length of the line EF. Line EF at the moment is, again, pointing away from me. It's as if it's just a single line, it's not a surface. So think of even your pencil. Looking down like that, you can't see the true length of it because it's pointed at an angle. To see the true length of it, you have to look straight at it. You have to look perpendicular to it. So we can do that in either the elevation or in the plan view. It doesn't really make much difference. I'm going to do it in the plan view. So if I look perpendicular to it, you can see already it's actually... It's a, it's a vertical line on, in terms of the drawing. So if I just bring my T-square out 90 degrees to that, that's looking perpendicular to that line. I'll set up an X1, Y1 line. And if I was to go back two measurements for my heights, it would bring me back to the elevation. So I'll get the height of F, and I'll get the height of E. I'll mark them off, join them together, and it'll give me a true length of the line. So that's F and then I get E as well. So I join them together. Okay. And what I've drawn is a true length of the line EF. Again I label it. And I'm going to use that true length to create my hexagon, eight equal sides. So it measures approximately in around 29, 30 millimeters. So on a separate diagram, as the question asked, I'm going to draw a regular hexagon with that side. So I'll start it off as a flat line, get the length of that line, EF, mark it off. And just bring it down to 45 degrees and go around the full eight sides using that method. Oh, sorry, apologies, I'm after, it's not a hexagon, it's six sides, not eight sides. <laughs> um, so rather than 45 degrees, it should be 60 degrees.
the true length still applies. So we start off with the flat line. We have the initial length starting us off and it should be a 60 degree angle with the same length and go around all six sides for a hexagon. Apologies. actually take a shortcut you could just drop those points straight down they give you them on the base it should match up okay and just finish that off and we label that as surface s okay so that's the 2014 I will call it the angle question complete.